Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode number 300 for June 5th, 2017. Russ Laraway. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy to use cloud accounting software used by over 10 million small business owners. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. And by Betterment, the largest independent online financial advisor. For one low, transparent fee, Betterment gives you personalized advice and invests your money. For a limited time, you can get up to six months managed for free. Learn more at betterment.com slash triangulation. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Welcome to Triangulation. This is a show where we talk to some of the most fascinating and interesting people in and around technology. I am Megan Maroney, and today my guest is Russ Laraway. Russ is a uh, operational manager across, he's worked at Google, he's worked at Twitter, he was in the Marines, Wharton School of Business, and now is one of the co-founders of Candor Inc., which is an organization dedicated to radical candor. We'll explain what that is in a minute. Welcome to the show, Russ. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks for coming up here. Uh, you, uh, Candor Inc. is down in the peninsula, right? Correct. Yeah. You guys are in the Flintstones building? We are, yeah. We're in the Flintstones house, which um, I, I don't know how many of your viewers are in the Bay Area versus other places, but most people in the Bay Area have driven past this crazy orange house along the 280. Uh, going either north or south, doesn't matter. And um, so now we're in there renting it as an office and um, lots of people are very excited to come have a meeting there because they say, <laughs> I've seen it so many times and I've never been in there. And so now we get lots of people coming to visit us. Awesome. Well, I first heard about you. I listened to Gretchen Rubin's Happier podcast. Mm -hmm. um, she had the Happier Project. Uh, it's just great advice for people who um, are just trying to live more mindfully and you know be as happy as you can. And and she, in January, introduced her Onward Project, which is uh, you know sort of a network of podcasts through Panoply. Um, and one of yours, your podcast was one of the first one I listened to, uh, called Radical Candor. And uh, so, talk a little bit about what Radical Candor is. Yeah. Well, f first, the the po this the podcast itself. Um, our our little tagline is um, how not to hate the boss you have or be the boss you hate. So, trying to give advice to both you know the employee and the and the boss to have better relationships at work. And that really is, I, I'd say, the essence of Radical Candor. It's all about having better relationships at work. And I think the summary idea is this two by two that we've created um, where there are two axes and one axis, the horizontal axis is you have to challenge directly and the vertical axis is you have to care personally. And um, when you do both of those at the same time with the people that you work with in any direction, not just manager to employee, but in all directions, uh, that's when you achieve radical candor. When you simultaneously can challenge people directly and help them care personally, that's radical candor. So, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what uh, you do. You, you, you guys have uh, an app, you have a podcast, like I said, and uh, coaching services for companies. But for anyone who's listening to this and is just like, well, I'm, I'm not a boss. Uh, I, maybe I, I don't even have a boss. Maybe I work for myself and um, those people probably have clients. But, but tell uh, us a little bit about how we can use this beyond just if you're a boss and trying to be a better boss. Yeah, that's really a question. Um, the... The essence of, like, radical candor really is first and foremost about feedback. And if you think about why, why give people feedback, in, in our minds, the whole reason for feedback is to help people have more success, help people have more success. And so, um, and we break feedback down into two main parts. There's criticism, which is the purpose of which is to help people know what to do better. And then there's praise which the purpose of which is to help people know what to do more of, to show them what success looks like, to show them what's valued, not to help them feel good or something like that. Really important. 
And if you just imagine for a second, any person in any company or nonprofit or church or volunteer group or school, it doesn't matter. Ideally, they're working on something that supports the overall objectives of the company or, or, or whatever. And um, when you give people feedback, if your objective of criticism is to help them know what to do better and the objective of praise to help them know what to do more of, well, that's re really you're helping them know what to do more of in terms of the work that they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. The work that they're doing or the behaviors that they're manifesting. And so um, when you give someone praise, you're helping them have more success because you help them repeat things that they've done well. When you give them criticism about their work, you're helping them learn how to do things better and therefore have a bigger impact, have more success. If you just start there and the idea of feedback, and you believe that, the idea of feedback, it's, a, it's the, one of the best, most persistent ways we have to help people have more success. It's absolutely crazy to me to think that the only person's job to give someone feedback is their boss. It actually seems most fair and you have the best chance of creating the most success if everybody's engaged in giving a person feedback with the, and the, sp the spirit is to help them have more success. That's kind of the first idea. And really the second idea, if you're not a boss, is we do give a lot, a lot of the a relationships, a two-way street, it's two, two sides of every coin. And so it's not particularly useful to only talk about the boss's angle in a relationship. In fact, it's, it's at best 50% complete. So when we talk about this stuff, we try to talk about relationships in totality. Um, and there's, there's, always, there's always a boss and, and, and a not boss in that every time. So I think for those couple of reasons, I think it's worth sticking around and, and listening because we end up talking about both halves of the relationship nearly always. And when you were talking about feedback, you told a great story in one of your podcasts about asking for feedback and how important that is as a practice. You told a story, your uh, son is a competitive gymnast and how often they uh, ask for feedback. It's par part of the process. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, well, I can tell you that story. Maybe if I could set it up a little bit. Um, I think that, uh, so one of the biggest, I talk to a lot of companies every week. Um, probably, I bet somewhere, some form or fashion, 50 companies a week right now. And the mo most of these companies, I believe, would be so excited to have a feedback quality problem mm -hmm. because that would mean feedback's actually happening. Um, at least, you know, the first order bit that most of these companies are trying to solve for is that their leadership and people and, and in 360 degree form, you know, employees are giving each other feedback. It's just not happening uh, with any kind of frequency. So kind of start there. And if you think about for one second, why doesn't feedback happen, especially the criticism side? The praise side is a little easier, although that also doesn't happen often because I think a lot of people think it's like an ego stroke or it can feel patronizing. Um, but on the criticism side, the main reason I believe that people don't give feedback is because they fear an emotional response. And the reason you fear an emotional response is because we all know it's actually the most natural thing when someone gives you criticism around your work or your behavior, the most natural reaction is to have a threat response and your defenses surge. And we've all felt this. And, and to, you're not dysfunctional if this is how you feel, by the way. Um, you're just human. Uh, some of us manage that better than others, right? And that's sort of the key. But anyway, when you know that you normally have this response to criticism, it's very easy for you to empathize that likely another person will have an emotional, defensive, threat-based response to criticism. And because of that fear, we don't believe that the, the risk of creating that fear, we don't believe the upside is really worth it, and so we don't give feedback. Right? So that's kind of that's kind of the, uh, the the context for this. And so one of the best ways to break down, I think, to break down this barrier that people feel um, to giving feedback is for people to obsessively ask for it. And in fact, whenever we run our workshops for companies, they want to know exactly what what should they do first. And and maybe counterintuitively, the thing that we tell them is, look, don't worry about becoming great at giving feedback right away. Actually, get great at asking for it. And we teach a little uh, Andy Grove-inspired process for asking for it. So getting that story, um, the my son's a competitive gymnast. And the whole point of the story is to help help you understand that there's this culture on the team of giving praise and criticism specifically to help the gymnast get better. And so what happens is a gymnast, a gymnast um, fails hundreds of times before they succeed, hundreds of times, um, because the things that they're doing are so difficult physically to achieve. And so what this looks like, let's take the vault, which I think many people are probably familiar with having watched the Olympics or something like that. Um, you run down, there's a vault run, it's a blue mat, you run down the mat, you hit a springboard and you do some kind of movement over top, over top of the vault, often you know, includes some sort of flip or something. You land on the mat on the other side 
And what, what the gymnast does in practice is they turn to their coach immediately and they look at the coach and that's, that's their way of requesting feedback. And so they, at that moment, they're asking the coach for feedback. And the coach will say something like, oh, you held your hollow too long. And the gymnast will nod and they'll run back to the line and they'll try again. And this time they'll try to not hold their hollow so long, right? Um, and so to break all of that down, gymnast turns, ask for feedback. Coach offers them criticism. Miraculously, these kids are, by the way, the kids on my son's team are 11 and 12 years old. Not a shred of defensiveness about that. Just understand. And then they, they go back and try again. And there's, there's, this is a very rich example for a number of reasons, by the way. First is no defensiveness, the request for feedback, the culture clearly, it's just understood that the feedback is there to help them improve. But one of the most important insights here is that imagine if that coach, this was a Monday night that the coach gave that, that you know, you held your hollow too long. Imagine if the coach decided to wait until Friday to give that feedback. How useful would that be? Not, I'm, I'm here to tell you not. Hey, do you remember, <laughs> do you remember that second vault practice run you did on Monday night? You held your hollow, just would be useless. So that, that's, the, that's the idea behind asking for feedback. I love that image of just like turning around. It's part, part of the process. It's, and like you said, no defensiveness, because I feel like that, like you said, like we're very defensive. And, and I think sometimes it's hard to ask for feedback. You think like, oh, you know, you were raised to just say like, you know, not to say like, how am I doing? How am I doing? Do I look okay? Like, do I, did I perform okay? You know, it seems a little desperate. But when you think about it in that image of, you know, the gymnast just looking back, doing it again, looking back, doing it again. I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I think it's a really good image, and and it it just serves. It's just a really good um, metaphor for thinking about feedback. The the importance of it being immediate, the importance of the importance of it being immediate, the importance of it being in person. Um, the gymnast asking the culture, the established culture, where everyone understands feedback is not about kicking someone in the shins. Mm -hmm. It's just about helping you do things better. So I think I think it serves. I think it serves a lot of purposes. I I, I agree. I'm, I'm glad it resonated. <laughs> it did well. And specific feedback, right? You say like, what if he had waited uh, a week or what if he had just said good job and then the next kid came up and he's a good job and the next thing you know he's very specific uh, about something not just like a pat on the back keep going yeah exactly mm -hmm. yeah I mean we're taught that as parents too like don't tell your kids good job I know in one of your podcasts Kim uh, who was the other co-founder she says you know if it's something you tell your dog probably <laughs> you shouldn't tell your co-workers so something more specific than yeah. than uh, good job I should say that Kim Scott is your co-founder mm -hmm. um, she is also from Google uh, did you work with her at Google we or? did yeah. yeah we worked together in fact she hired me out of the bowels of the Wharton School <laughs> um and uh, she was sick and she had a space heater in there. And I came in in like a wool jacket, it was freezing, you know, it's November, and, um, but not in that room because Kim had a space heater turned up to about, I don't know, I think you had to actually measure it in Kelvin. It was so hot in there. And so, um, uh, and so I was sweating and she was in a white t-shirt and, and uh, you know, it went okay. I ended up getting a job at Google and, and worked on her team actually for a couple of years. And then you left and went to Twitter from there, or did you have an in-between? Yeah, I actually had a, I had a small stop in between that uh, it's like it's like Voldemort though. You know, you're not supposed to say Voldemort's name in Harry <laughs> Potter, uh, so I don't ever name this experience because it's actually kind of a bad one. Um, but about a six month stint with a with a tiny little company, it's not it's not operating anymore. Um, really interesting idea, um, but a very sick culture. And so um, I had about six months in between Google and Twitter and then, you know, Twitter toward the end of 2012. Awesome. And then, um, but I guess we'll, let's back up to the Marines. Uh -huh. uh, that's, uh, did, you went to the Wharton School after the Marines or before? After the Marines, after yeah. After the Marines. Yeah, so four years in the Marine Corps <clears throat> where my last job there was a company commander, which means, uh, of an infantry company, which means you're in charge of about 175 combat Marines. Um, and that was awesome. That's, that's many consider infantry company commander the dream job in the Marine Corps. And I was lucky to have gotten that a little bit earlier, a few years ahead of uh, what is normal. And um, got out of the Marines and actually founded my own company with my best friend uh, from childhood, from seventh grade. Uh, and we helped companies um, be, be more efficient in their, really their supply chain operations, manufacturing distribution companies. Um, you know, they had really messy, unsafe warehouses and, and messy processes in their, in their supply chains and, and production and shipping. And we helped them fix that stuff. And we, we did that for about five years. And after that, uh, went to, went to the Wharton school. 
And so I've heard you, you've said that enthusiasm is one of the um, one of the important things about the Marines, not mm -hmm. things, but one of the leadership lead leadership trait. Yeah, lead leadership trait. What are some other things that you learned in the Marines that um, have helped you in management? S so much. The, the first thing that I think for many is counterintuitive, actually, this idea of care personally that we talk about, you know, our vertical axis and radical candor. I would say that a very large percentage of what I learned about care personally in a leadership context, I actually learned from the Marines, which the, the reason I say it's probably a little counterintuitive is because I think what most people think of military leadership is what they see in a movie, you know, which might be say a boot camp type setting where there's some drill instructor, some Marine yelling at a bunch of people who just had their head shaved. It almost seems like bullying. And, um, and it serves a very important purpose, but, um, and they and they and they yell and there's this idea of instant obedience to orders that I think most people associate with the military, but the reality is that day to day military leadership looks nothing like that. You can't just tell someone what to do, and then they just go and do it. Uh, just like anywhere else, people have an awful lot of questions. Um, you have to have a compelling vision, and you have to get people on board with that vision, and you have to give them a chance to influence the vision for the for the organization. Um, and then you have to set objectives and you have to manage to those objectives. By the way, working with a number of cross-functional counterparts, the people who get you your ammunition, the people who get you your trucks, the people who get you your radios, the people who um, reserve range space for you to go shoot. So uh, military leadership actually looks an awful lot like leadership in the real world um, with, and with all the commensurate uh, ambiguity to go along with it because there's nothing more ambiguous than, than combat, I think. So... Um, uh, but this care personally thing, um, there's a, a famous general, his name is General John Lejeune. Uh, there's a base in North Carolina named after General Lejeune. He's, he's so famous. And um, he charters the officer, he, he says to, an, to officers, here's how you need to think about your relationship with your men. And historically, the Marines have talked about things in terms of men. And so that this, apologize for that part of this, but it's, it's a, a little bit of a historical leftover. And he said, um, the relationship of officer to enlisted is that of teacher to student, father to son. And we can, we can say father to daughter, mother to daughter, mother to son too. We can add all those in now because um, there are outstanding female officers all over the Marine Corps now. So that of teacher to student, father to son. And think about that for a second. You're a 22-year-old uh, second lieutenant is your first job. And you get in front of this group of 40 Marines. That's your first job is to manage this group of 40 Marines. And your job is to be that of teacher to student, father to son. Um, that's, a, that's a tough gig. And underneath all of that, it's really, it's really important to get to know your Marines. It's really important to know what's going on in their lives. Um, if for no other reason than understanding what's going on in their personal lives, what's going, their personal effectiveness directly affects their combat effectiveness. Right? Just start, there's a very functional aspect to that, but it's not just functional. Uh, there's a lot of trust built when there's a real relationship that happens between, um, between leaders and, and those that they lead. And so um, you, are, you are absolutely expected to treat your Marines like human beings to, to an extent that, that I've, I've not seen leaders charged with in the private sector really ever. Um, and so that, that was one of the biggest things that I learned there. You mentioned um, enthusiasm. There, the, leader, the Marine Corps teaches 13 leadership traits. And there's a handy little acronym for that. Happy to share if you'd like. Enthusiasm of, is one of those. And um, we, we all know, because we've all felt this, enthusiasm can be very contagious. And in fact, the Marines, there's a joke that they say all the time in the Marines, which is false motivation is better than no motivation, <laughs> right? Because um, the idea is that sometimes things really stink. I mean, I've been soaking wet, hungry, dehydrated. Um, you know, we used to be a small boat company and we'd be in the ocean and we'd get, we'd get out down, you know, in California, the water is not warm at all, ever. <laughs> and it's miserable, right? It's cloudy, of course, and, and, and then it starts to rain, awful. And uh, it's real easy for everyone to turn inward and become um, disheartened, you know, and negative. And that's not good. And um, so it's one of those times where maybe a little bit of false motivation, you can create some, it can become a little contagious and we can make the most out of these terrible circumstances. So false motivation is better than no motivation. Right, is one fake of the it till you make it, right? Yeah, <laughs> fake it till you make it, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to talk about one of the other con uh, uh, quadrants, ruinous empathy, mm -hmm. which is as bad as it sounds. <laughs> First, <laughs> I uh, want to take a break and thank one of our sponsors. 
This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by FreshBooks. If you are a small business owner, an entrepreneur, you have your own business, you want to do the business part, but you probably have some clients you need to build too. And that can be really time consuming and can take you away from what you want to do, but it doesn't have to. Stop chasing your clients, save time, and know where your business stands with FreshBooks. FreshBooks new version of their cloud accounting software will make running your business easy, fast, and secure. Their newly improved platform was developed by a small team of 10 using design thinking and lean UX processes. The FreshBooks dashboard gives you quick access to your spending, your outstanding balances, total profit and accounting reports like sales, tax summary, and profit and loss. So you're not messing around in there. It's not confusing. It's really well designed so you can get in and out of there and do everything you need to do and then get back to what you really want to do. FreshBooks makes it fast and easy to create and send professional looking invoices. With FreshBooks payments, your customer can pay straight from their invoices. If you've ever gotten an invoice from someone who uses FreshBooks, you know it looks really professional and makes you want to use their services again. See what invoices have been sent, viewed, and paid as well as outstanding invoice totals. No more stress of chasing your clients everywhere, trying to get them to pay, have that awkward conversation. If they've already paid, you can see if they have paid and you don't have to ask them. You can also uh, use their brand new and set recurring invoices, send automatic payment reminders or set automatic late fees. As a business owner, you know time is your most valuable asset and FreshBooks new time tracking feature addresses common challenges. You can easily bill for time by clients and by specific projects. Just press play to track your time to the minute. Quickly identify gaps in the all new timeline. When it comes time to create an invoice, you'll know what you did and when you did it. You don't need to keep track of that yourself. It's super easy to do it through FreshBooks time tracking. You can stay connected to your clients and keep tabs on your business no matter where you are with the FreshBooks app. Track expenses by snapping a photo of your receipt or connecting your bank account, your credit card automatically, and you can import your expenses daily so you can get rid of that shoebox. We've all had the big envelope or the shoebox or some other way of keeping our receipts. It's nonsense. You don't need it. You can use FreshBooks. It's so much easier. FreshBook integrates with some of the apps that you already use, and you'll be glad you found Stripe, Shopify, Gusto, Acuity Scheduling, and more. FreshBooks is adding new features and improvements to their platform on a weekly basis. So check back. You'll see all the things that they're constantly adding for a better experience for you and for your clients. It's no wonder why they were included in the Forbes Small Giants list for 2017. You can try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash triangulation and enter triangulation in the how did you hear about us section. And we thank FreshBooks for their support of this episode of triangulation. I am talking to Russ Laraway. He is one of the founders of Candor Inc., formerly of the Marines, Google, Twitter, and we're talking about radical candor, which uh, is an idea that uh, Russ and his co-founder Kim, is, is they are using to try to help businesses uh, everywhere. And one of the quadrants, uh, we've talked about uh, s some of them, one of his ruinous empathy, which um, sounds bad. And it really, it's it spoke to me as one of the quadrants that spoke to me the most. Let's talk a little bit about ruinous empathy. Yeah, ruinous empathy. So one of the things that, in thinking about radical candor, one of the most important things to note is that um, these quadrants are given life by the axes. Really important. So what is ruinous empathy? Well, um, it's, a, it's fun. It's a fun name for the idea that you're very high care personally and very low challenge directly. Very high care personally, very low challenge directly. And I, I'd say for our money, um, again, I talk, to, I talk to all these companies every week. I, I bet most, most of the leadership mistakes, in fact, probably closer to three quarters that are getting made um, are in this quadrant. And um, there are a lot of leaders out there that view themselves as, as that nurturing type. I'm, I'm, I got my teams back. I'm going to take care of my team. You know, maybe like a den dad, right? You know, de something like that got my teams back. I'm going to take care of them. I really care about them. You know, in, in professional sports, sometimes they'll call it a player's coach. And a lot of times what happens is that people on that team are just getting the constant encouragement, the constant pat on the back, um, maybe good praise, but often actually nonspecific praise. Um, it's a very positive rah-rah cheerleader kind of environment. 
And what ends up happening is that um, the people who could use some feedback around things that they can do better, and even some specific feedback about things they're doing well, they don't get that a lot of times. Um, because that's just not how someone who's operating very high care personally, very low challenge directly. It's just not how they're operating. And so um, while for a little while that feels great, um, people will go home and talk to their spouses and say, my boss is amazing. Um, they're so great. They always have our back. They're so nice. Um, but then over time, you're left feeling, you're left wondering, have I been, have I been improving? Am I improving? Is my work any good? Um, are we getting the right things done? Because you're not really hearing about that from your boss. And, um, and so often um, that this doesn't end well. Um, because a person leaves either because they're just not sure if they're having an impact and most people want to have an impact at their job or because they are failing and they're not getting the feedback and ultimately it ends in them having to depart for reasons out of their own control. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of downsides to this idea of ruinous empathy. Again, high care personally, low challenge directly. Um, leaders and, and employees are just too nice. Yeah, and so often it it also uh, it it seems to me it's like uh, you you forgive a lot of things because you're afraid to give feedback and you let things um, you know pile up and pile up and then it's just like you just fire the person because you know you yeah. can't or you just yell at them or blow up at them or um, yeah I mean that 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 uh, and you're not just I mean bosses aren't necessarily just doing that because they're too nice but a lot of bosses you talk about are afraid to give feedback, to give real criticism because of how it would look on them, like how it would reflect badly on them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Um, ruinous empathy, I care personally, low challenge, it comes from a good place often. Um, I, I've, had, I've had a number of companies call to say, I, I think we'd, ra we'd like to make a transition from being nice to being kind. Mm. And, and actually that, that might, I don't know how that sounds for a lot of people, but it really resonates for me. Um, being kind, because one way to think about giving tough feedback is to be kind and clear. And you could even think about substituting in our axes, kind for care personally, and on the horizontal axis, clear. Um, I used to work at Twitter and Dick Costello was the CEO and he used to teach managing at Twitter. And one of the ideas that he presented that really resonated and stuck with me was, was basically another, another two by two, which was, um, the more difficult the message you have to deliver, the less clear you're likely to become. Mm. You have to, you have to re remember that. And again, it's not because you're dysfunctional, it's because you're human and it's hard to get out a difficult message. And so, but you still have to, it's your job to do that, to help people get better. Um, and so you've got to overcome this fear. You've got to find the courage to do it and you've got to fight for your clarity in that conversation. The more difficult the message, the less clear you are likely to become. And uh, that, that's, that's really at the heart of ruinous empathy. Um, some people are so unclear as to never even try to deliver the message, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so stuff's getting swept under the rug and we know what happens. Eventually you end up with a huge pile under the rug that everybody's tripping over. And so that's not good either. And yeah, next thing you know, someone has to get fired because they're just not doing their job and they've not get, been, it's not been fair. Mm -hmm. so they haven't been really given a chance to improve. So feedback is really, and criticism is a gift. I think so. I, I, I actually, it's interesting. Uh, Kim uses that a lot. I use it very little. Um, I, think, I think it is. I think the problem is that it never feels like that to the person receiving the feedback. Mm -hmm. No, I, and this is like the big... We, we teach this stuff and I'm careful to say to companies, there's no silver bullet for giving feedback that if you craft it in just the right way with just the right attributes and just the right um, tone and just the right day of the week and, and setting, that when you give criticism to someone that they're gonna say, oh, wow, thank you. Thank you so much. I really needed that. I, that is such a gift. <laughs> yeah. I, I just I just don't think that's really how it goes most times. It would be great if everyone could get their minds around the idea. The receiver and the giver, no matter what direction, um, peer to peer, uh, employee to boss, boss to employee, doesn't matter. It would be great if everyone could get their minds around feedback truly is a gift. 
I just don't think most people, I just think for most people, especially criticism, it doesn't actually feel that way. And I, sometimes I worry that saying feedback is a gift maybe mismanages a lot of folks' expectations. It's like, hey, don't get upset. I, this is a gift. It's like, yeah, it doesn't feel like a gift, right? It feels like you're kicking me in the shins. Yeah. So you can get upset about it. Yeah. <laughs> so also uh, you, in one of your podcasts, you talk about um, feedback all, not necessarily being correct. Like as a, as a boss or um, an employee, sometimes you get feedback that you don't think is accurate. Yeah. Um, and Kim had a great, <laughs> in her gift metaphor that like if someone gives you a sweater and it's too small, you don't necessarily have to wear it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can return it. Um, yeah, this is super important because, um, you know, we talk, a lot of the stuff we talk about can be pretty touchy feely and we, we really try to talk to people about managing their emotions when they're getting feedback. And, and the specific context we tend to talk about this in is we'll, we'll really say to leaders, you have to go ask for feedback. You have to go ask for feedback. And we teach them a little process for doing that, et cetera. And one of the things that, one of the steps in that process is after you've asked a go-to question, step one, and after you've shut your mouth and resisted the temptation to start answering your own question and let the other person answer. The third step we, we mention is uh, listen with the intent to understand and not respond. This is really hard to do. Uh, you wanna be careful at this moment. If, if you, imagine if you're a leader and you've asked someone for feedback and they start to open up. This moment is gold. And so don't wreck it by starting to cross-examine them or to give me some examples or, or get defensive. Just listen with the intent to understand and not respond. Don't get mad, get curious. Don't get mad, get curious. Don't get mad, get curious. Um, as the feedback's coming to you, there may be some things you don't agree with. I just wanna say that at this moment, that is not the time to disagree with the feedback. It is the time to listen. And what that looks like is something very simple. So what I think I hear you saying is that if I were to do X and Y and Z differently, it would impact your life positively in A and B and C ways, right? So basic checking for understanding, making sure you really understand what's being said to you. And then walk away, you know, especially if you really disagree. If you actually feel like the feedback's 100% great, that's cool. Just keep going and make sure you say that. This is really good feedback. I actually, I think you're right. I've been, miss, I've, been, I've been missing this, you know, and I really appreciate you highlighting it for me. But that's also not really real life. Real life, there's bits and pieces. Some resonate, some doesn't. What we try to encourage people to do, <clears throat> if they're feeling like they don't agree with a lot of the feedback, is to walk away and try to find something you agree with, right? So, um, there, there's this idea of the 5% rule. Even if you believe you completely disagree with the feedback, there, 5%, there's something in there you can learn from. Um, and so that's the first thing is don't focus so much on the things you disagree with. Try to find the thing that you actually agree with. Um, and then the fourth step is reward the candor, which is to go back to this person who gave you feedback and, and follow up and say, listen, this one thing that you said really resonated and here are a couple things I'm gonna try to do better. Now, for the other percentage that you didn't agree with. It's as important to follow up and talk about that as well. Which is really important. It doesn't happen in that moment, right? This person's just taken a risk. You've asked for feedback. This person's just get, taken a risk. It can feel very deflating, very deflating. If the very, all you do is disagree with the feedback, then they're saying to themselves, why would I do this? Mm -hmm. But if you can find something to agree with and um, you can talk openly about, listen, I don't, I don't necessarily know if I can respond to this other piece of feedback that you gave me and here's my rationale why, um, at least the person can feel heard. I, I have a story that I tell <clears throat> about a time at Twitter when um, one of my employees gave me feedback that uh, he, he, he roughly said that he thought I was taking credit for his work, which I, I just would I would never ever do. It's it's the exact opposite of how I've 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 built my leadership career. Um, far more likely to overdo it on making sure on highlighting people's work on my team. And so in the end, after I, I heard the feedback and, and asked a bunch of questions, I, I can tell you that there was zero, zero percent of the feedback was factually accurate. The guy had really just created this in his head and imagined it and it just wasn't accurate. Um, however, what I realized was there had to be something I was doing that caused him to feel this way, right? The guy wasn't some conspiracy, crazy conspiracy theorist, right? And so that was what I tried to get at ultimately, was to really understand what could I change in the way I was behaving and the way I was operating that would help you understand that I'm not stealing credit for your work. So even in something where there was zero, zero accuracy to the accusation, which was a pretty tough accusation, by the way, um, there was still something for me to learn in the way I was communicating to help this person understand I was not taking credit for their work.
But isn't there a case that sometimes it is really, it's not me, it's you kind of situation? Like, isn't, like, you say that he's sort of created this out of his own uh, mind. I mean, can you get into a situation as a manager where, you know, people are giving you false feedback and you're constantly saying, like, well, I must be doing something wrong when maybe you're not doing anything wrong at all. And maybe it really is. You say there's always something you can learn from yeah. I think, um, I guess theoretically it's possible that you're not doing anything wrong. I, I'm I also, not doing anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, I also, I also don't think that remotely reflect, reflects reality. Yeah. It's possible you're doing a bunch of stuff wrong and it's possible you're getting feedback about the wrong stuff. Um, I, think, I think the important, I, I have noticed that, so to, so to have bias is to be human. And I have noticed that people are more likely to be very in tune with and in touch with the things they're doing well. And they are much more often blind to the things they're doing poorly. Um, Rory McIlroy is the second or third best golfer in the world. D do you know how many coaches he has? No. Um, he's got at least two. One for hitting the ball far and one for hitting the ball short. And um, second or third best golfer in the world. Guy does most things right most days. And he's got two people and rough, what I'd say roughly their job description is, is to tell him what he's doing wrong. Um, and just think about that for a second, because most people are not operating in their industry or their profession at Rory McIlroy's level, mm -hmm. right? Second best golfer in the entire planet, the entire planet. And therefore, by the way, the entire solar system, because there's no other golfers in this, except on earth. That we know of. That we know of, yeah. <laughs> um, and so um, this guy has two people that he pays to criticize his work. Um, this is a coping mechanism to help him. This is how he gets better. I just think we're far more likely to see and understand and be in touch with the things we're doing well. And we're more likely to deny the things we're doing poorly. So if I go out there and say, listen, it's possible your employees are giving you feedback and you're doing everything right. People will latch onto that. And it's just never true. Mm -hmm. you're, you're usually making a lot of mistakes. Do you know why? Not necessarily because you're a bad manager, but because you're human. Mm -hmm. And um, even if people whiff on giving you feedback and they're giving you feedback on the wrong stuff, if you just keep trying and you keep going for it and you keep trying to dig, you're going to uncover some, some stuff that can be better on the team that you could do better, a better way you can serve your team. Um, I ju I just, I'm just sure of it. Um, none of us is constantly getting it all right. I, yeah. That's just not, that's not, that's not possible. Yeah, I guess my point was um, it's easy to go in the other direction, um, blaming yourself for everything. You know, oh, well, what am I doing? What am I doing when, and not looking at other people, which I think that probably is in the ruinous empathy quadrant as well, because it's, you know, sort of self-involved. Like, I I just want everyone to like me, you know, mm. sort of like. Oh. Yeah, good, good. So so definitely, definitely um, this is not about trying to be liked. Mm -hmm. um, the... Obsessively asking for feedback. Look, you, in the end, you always have the option to act on some feedback and not act on other feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And by asking for feedback on yourself um, does not mean you can't still challenge your team directly. In fact, it means you should st you should challenge your team directly. So it's not like you. It's not like it's it has to all be about you. But I will say this: if you're a leader on a team, um, I believe this firmly. You are responsible for everything that team does or fails to do everything the team does or fails to do. I don't think most people think about uh, accountability quite that strongly in m most places that I've seen. You're responsible for everything that organization does or fails to do. So if things are going poorly on the team, it might be that one individual is the problem and that person needs to be challenged directly and they need some very crisp and clear feedback. Um, but my, my guess is that if there's a problem on the team, usually involves more than one person. Um, and that's your, your job is to resolve that conflict. And so it could be as simple as, you know, what could, the question you could ask your team is what can be better on this team? It doesn't have to be, what can I do better, mm -hmm. right? You could change it up. What can be better on this team? And then encourage the team to bring to you the, the things that are wrong and dysfunctional on the team. And it is absolutely your job to fix that. That may not be the, you're doing something exactly wrong, but you kind of are by not having fixed it. Fair, you couldn't have fixed it if you didn't know about it. 
right? But now you know about it. And now you've got an opportunity to fix it. Is that, is that a helpful mm -hmm. distinction? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So you talked about giving uh, feed, asking as a manager, asking feedback from uh, your direct reports or from everyone around you. Um, what, it, it sounds a little scary probably to people to give feedback to their boss. Right. Um, should people, I hate to use the word should, but um, when is it, when do you know it's okay to give your boss feedback if they're not asking for it? That's a really good question. Really tough one. Um, the first thing to say is that th the reason this is a really good question is because it's important to acknowledge there's an awful lot of risk in giving your boss feedback, right? An awful lot of risk. If this person cannot hear or accept your feedback, you just put yourself in, in a, an extremely risky situation. So um, the first bit of advice we give people is account for your risk. Um, some of the some of the things that people write in with in the podcast, I mean, I, I will sometimes advise them that maybe this isn't maybe this isn't the best time for you to give that feedback to your boss. I'm I'm worried about your your situation now. Way back way back when Kim and I first got going uh, about a year ago, um, I think she had responded to somebody uh, in an email. They'd written an email and she gave them some advice about giving feedback to their boss and the, and the person. Uh, wrote back or tweeted back something like, gave radical candor to my boss, got fired. <laughs> so there's real risk here. Now, now importantly, Kim, of course, felt terrible. Yeah. She felt terrible. But, uh, and she reached back out and offered, look, anything you need, oh. uh, you need introductions, et cetera. Yeah. And, and the guy said, listen, uh, I wrote that to be a little bit cheeky. He said, it was actually the best thing that's happened to me. Right. That's great. And so, so if you're in a situation where you're scared to death to give your boss feedback, that might not be the best situation for you. And and we borrow from Gretchen Rubin on this pretty liberally. She always says, don't forget to quit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that if you're, you're nervous about giving your boss feedback, therefore quit. Um, I think that you have to take full counting your risk. And if your boss is a raving lunatic, like there definitely are some out there, um, that's, and you're scared to death, you, that just may not be the right spot. So when is it okay to give feedback to your boss? One of the things we tell people to do is actually ask permission. Um, literally ask permission. Um, so, and that might sound something like this. You walk into your regular one-on-one -on -one and you say to your boss, listen, I, there's something that's on my mind here. Um, and uh, and it, involves, it involves kind of the way you're leading the team. And I was wondering if you would be open to me giving you a little bit of feedback on that. And if they say no, that'd be pretty weird and <laughs> yeah. uh, for sure. Um, but that's important. And if they say no, it's no. Right, you're accounting for your risk, and that's sad and unfortunate. And you got to kind of think about what's next after that. But if they say yes, they just said yes. And importantly, we, I always I always tell people when you think about your feedback, you should do a, you should do a couple things. First, you should actually try to write down your feedback. And we usually give people the situation behavior impact uh, framework from Center for Creative Leadership. Here's the situation where you you did such and such a behavior, and here's the impact of that behavior. Right. In the staff meeting, you you constantly making jokes, and the impact of that was it was disruptive, and we got off the agenda. Situation behavior impact. Another structure that's helpful is situation work impact. So big customer meeting, here was your pitch, the work, uh, the pitch was unclear, and therefore we didn't get the business. You know something like that. that. That's the idea. So the first thing to do before you even step into the office with your boss and ask permission to get feedback is to write down what you plan to say. Not a novel, a quick SBI, quick SWI kind of kind of thing, um, because writing down your feedback is an incredible clarification step. You might even practice saying your feedback uh, to somebody, a friend, uh, someone in HR, something like that, because that will help you further clarify what you want to say. The second step that gets skipped way too often is to write down your objectives. What are you hoping to achieve in this conversation? And the reason is sometimes when we have tough feedback to give, we've, we're, we're, when we're ready to actually give it, we've become frustrated. And it's very easy to manifest like you're ready to kick someone in the shins when really what you probably want is to be helpful and you want, just, you want, you know, you want to make your life a little bit better, but you don't really want to kick someone in the shins. That's never gotten anybody anywhere. You know, catch more bees with honey than with vinegar. And so by writing down your objectives and clarifying what you hope to achieve, that can really help you. And by the way, you can be explicit when you give the feedback about those objectives. That can really help you show up not as someone looking to kick your boss in the shins, but as someone who's trying to help your boss be better, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that's, that's kind of the first step before you ever go in there. And so now you're in this spot where if your boss does give you permission, you've got a really clear 
idea of the feedback you want to give. You've got a really clear idea of what you're hoping to achieve. Um, and that will probably set you up to give better feedback to your boss um, that hopefully they can f they find accessible and hopefully they find actionable and that they can kind of work to, to be better. Um, it can go off the rails. I'm not going to pretend like it can't go off the rails. I, we're very careful to say your boss has a lot more power in this equation than you do always. We know that. We'd love it if more bosses could be better at hearing feedback. It's hard to do just because they're, they're humans just like everybody else. Um, but I'd say if you take those two steps, that gives you the best chance to deliver high quality feedback to your boss and get on the back, get a good outcome on the back end of this um, so that you can make your life better at work. And the last thing to say is like, for, for so many people, by the time we hear from them, they're kind of ready to quit, right? They, they really, there's something they need to say to their boss and they're ready to quit. And, and we'll say, look, if you kind of like the place that you're in, if you're ready to quit, you're in the spot where you've got nothing to lose, right? You're ready to quit anyway. Why not go in and try to give your boss the feedback and try to salvage the situation? Because all else, you know, all else equal, you're in a pretty good spot. So why not go try to salvage the situation? Um, go and take the risk because the risk is very low because you were thinking of quitting anyway. And so... Um, just take that logic and now extend it back in, in time a little bit. Uh, if you realize that a bo your boss is doing something that frustrates you, that would eventually lead you to quit. Well, it really is in your best interest to try to intervene and make your life better if you'd like to avoid the outcome of quitting, right? Mm -hmm. And so hopefully people can find the courage to take that risk, <clears throat> do their best to give the feedback in a high quality way, um, and hopefully make their lives better at work. Awesome. Well, uh, you also talk about how not everyone should be a manager, and sometimes people get promoted uh, when they uh, might not. It might not be the right thing for them. Uh, I want to talk about that, but first, I want to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors. You know you should be investing. If you've got some money, you've earned some some money. You've been watching our show, and you've started your own business, you got some money, you want to be able to save it for your family, for your future, for your next business. You want to invest it. But how do you invest? You're working on your business. You don't want to think about investing. You don't want to just throw your money at someone who you may or may not trust. Betterment takes proven investment strategies that have been around forever, for decades, and uses technology to deliver them to more than 250,000 customers. <laughs> So we here at Twit, we love to throw problems at technology and throw technology at problems. That's one of the things that Betterment does, uses technology to be a smarter investor. Based on your financial planning needs, you get personalized advice for retirement planning, building wealth, and other financial goals. Betterment invests your money, working to lower taxes and increase returns. Betterment gives you a clear view of your net worth. And when you sync your outside accounts, such as bank accounts and other investments, you see everything. You can take a look at how you're doing, how your money's doing, and really be able to see and then invest even smarter. Another reason to choose Betterment, low transparent advisory fees compared to traditional services. 0.25% on assets under management, that's with an option to upgrade to 0.4% to 0.5% for access to a CFP or a licensed financial expert. If you want to talk to a licensed financial expert, you can do that through Betterman. It's what we love using a combination of humans, real people, and the technology. Betterman cares about keeping your money and your data secure which is why they have advanced data encryption and login protection. All that sounds good. Investing involves risk for a limited time. You can get up to six months managed for free. For more information, all you have to do is go to betterment.com. That's better because it's better, B-E-T-T-E-R-M-E-N-T.com slash triangulation. Don't forget to add the triangulation at the end so that they know that we sent you betterment rethink what your money can do for you. And we thank Betterment for sponsoring this episode of Triangulation. So uh, you, one of you, your uh, podcast episodes is about promotions and uh, whether, um, I guess I want to talk about whether you 
not everyone is meant to be a manager. And so how uh, do you know if you should be a manager? And also, um, how do you know when you should promote people? So let's let's start with that. How, how do, how do uh, managers know when it's right to promote someone? Um, I know you talk about how a lot of people just get promoted because they're the best at what they do. But then as a manager, you're not necessarily doing that anymore. So let's talk about that. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that that's, that's exactly right. So if you think about why this happens, um, imagine you're leading a team of five people or you're on a team of five people and um, everybody, and it's a sales team, let's say, and everybody knows who the top salesperson is on that team and they, everybody knows who the bottom salesperson. That's kind of a common, a common understanding in sales because everything's so tied to target, right? And a new leadership position opens up there on the team and the boss walks in and decides to give it to the lowest performing salesperson. Um, just think about that for a second. What, what is everybody on that team thinking? Wait, what? Tommy? Tommy's the worst. Tommy's the worst salesperson. How could Tommy get this leadership role? Um, so because, because I, I believe it's because of this dynamic where you're expected to give the highest performers the best, quote unquote, the best new opportunities that that leads to us lazily assessing a person for leadership, for management. Um, just because you're great at sales does not mean you will be good at sales management. Um, and just to, not to put, uh, just to, to give a little bit of context to this, um, there's, there's a, there's a really interesting study that I think people should, should take a look at. Um, it's called the global state of engagement and it's, uh, it was done by Gallup by a guy named Larry Eamond. And they talk at a very high level, they talk about people's disposition toward being managers. And so there's, there's kind of one slide in the study that, that really hammers this home. About 10% of people out there are kind of naturally predisposed to be good at management. Only 10%. And, and what, Larry, what Larry says is, look, you can, you can see these people on the playground when they're kids. You, you, you know exactly the type. They're organizing the other kids and, and kind of um, moving things from point A to point B. Um, there's the next 20% that uh, have the chops and just need, they need, they need a lot of polish, you know, but they have the chops. But then that leaves 70%, according to their study, uh, who should never be managers. And so the numbers are just way, they're just against us, right? Um, because most people by a lot, 70% of people should never be a manager. And so now the criteria by which we select someone to be a manager has nothing to do with the activities that a manager undertakes um, and has everything to do with the activities that made them a successful salesperson. And I am here to tell you that the activities that made you successful on Tuesday as a salesperson look nothing like the activities that will make you successful on Wednesday as a sales leader. Um, there's a little bit of credibility that works in your favor in the short run because you've been there, you've been in the trenches, but someone has to help the team set targets. Someone has to run one-on-ones with all the team members and coach them to be better salespeople, give them praise for the things they've done well and give them criticism for the things they've done poorly to help them get better. Um, someone needs to make sure there's a, a staff meeting every week or every other week that doesn't waste everyone's time. Um, someone needs to work with other teams, the, the, the teams that you, you're close to. Maybe there's a, a product team or an engineering team that needs to understand some changes that customers are asking for. Someone needs to help make sure all that stuff happens. There's a lot of real work that managers have to do that are absolutely not selling. Now, for just as a quick aside, for sales leaders, being in market is a part of the job, but it's a smaller part of the job than being an actual salesperson. So at the core of all of that, I think is just, it's just poor assessment. Um, we don't actually know how to assess managers. And even if we did, I think a lot of times we lack the courage. This Tommy, this lowest performing salesperson, it takes a lot of courage if you determine that Tommy's predisposed toward good coaching, Tommy's is organized, Tommy's good at communicating to a team, Tommy's good at setting objectives, Tommy has some real vision for where the team's gonna go, um, but Tommy can't sell worth anything. It takes a lot of courage to put Tommy in charge of that team. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna be answering uh, questions for four weeks from the team about why the heck is Tommy <laughs> in that job, you know? Um, so I think it boils, it boils down, there's just an assessment problem. And most of us don't know the, don't know how to assess whether someone could be a good good manager or not. 
So what about Susie, who's at the top, who's the top selling uh, salesperson, um, and you're not going to promote her to manager, what do you do to reward her? Yeah, well, um, Susie, there's a few things that we could we can do for Susie. Um, the first thing for, for Susie is, so I think, I think a lot of times rewards come in a couple different forms. Um, the first thing I would focus on for Susie is her, her growth. Um, for me, I think that where, where a lot of people find reward and they find um, where they're happiest at work is when they're learning and growing. And so for Susie, she's knocking out of the park. She's great at selling. Probably her job's getting a little easy for her. Are there larger accounts maybe that Susie can work on? Um, could Susie take on a project on the team? You know that helps the team. You know develop a better, better value proposition for their customers, given the way the customers are using their products. Um, is it possible uh, for Susie to take on? You know maybe a global brand, right? So you mentioned you work for Microsoft. Um, Microsoft's a company that when you sell to Microsoft, you have to think about them across the entire planet because Microsoft has a presence all over the globe. Could Susie take on a challenge with the Leviathan, like you know a big Leviathan like Microsoft? So the first thing <clears throat> I would do is Susie is think about if we have real options for her to continue to grow and learn, right? Um, I also think, you know, most likely Susie's being financially rewarded probably really well um, because she's knocking out of the park as a salesperson. Uh, by definition, that means she's beating her targets and usually um, salespeople have a pretty um, steep curve as when they're beating targets in terms of their variable compensation. So she's probably getting rewarded that way. But it might just be the case that Susie needs to find something else, right? Um, it, what's, what's unclear in this example is whether Susie really likes being a salesperson and she just wants to be the best salesperson she can be. Uh, in that case, you need to make sure that you honor Susie. You, you can t ask Susie to be a teacher. You can still ask Susie to be a mentor. You can ask Susie to do things on the team that help establish her as a subject matter expert um, and g give her kind of the respect that I think she deserves for being a very high performer. Susie might just crave the, the growth, learning, and big challenges, as I described. And, that, and it might be the truth that on your team, you don't have that much to offer her. There might be another role that's best for Susie to allow her to continue this aggressive growth trajectory that she's on, right? So you got to get underneath, I think you got to get underneath what Susie really wants and then work really hard to make sure that you get that for Susie. Um, it's possible Susie wanted to be the manager. Um, and it's possible Susie will be extremely unhappy that she didn't get the manager job. Um, you got to talk about it. You got to talk it through with her. And she might be so upset that she leaves your team, leaves your company. That doesn't mean you made the wrong decision. It'd be a tough one to take. Nobody wants to lose their top performing salesperson, but it just might be the outcome. And it's, then it might be the right outcome, even though it stings. Mm. Before uh, we started the show, you were talking about some, you've heard some horrible bosses stories and uh, shocked at some of the things that you have to say that seem obvious, like giving feedback, uh, not in front of everyone else. Yeah. Uh, what are some other uh, crazy boss stories or some of the, the basics things that you think that uh, you're surprised to find that, that a lot of bosses out there don't know? Yeah. So, so one of the, one of the, my favorite examples, is, we, we, we have a acronym for giving feedback called the HIP approach and HIP is an acronym give it humbly, give it helpfully, immediately in person. Um, anyway, one of the P's is praise in public, criticize in private. Praise in public, criticize in private. So first the praise, by the way, which is, uh, of course, not everybody's comfortable with getting praise in public, but there's a reason for it. And it's not just about making them feel good. The reason for public praise is because it gives everybody a chance to learn, right? Everybody can benefit from your success and see what success looks like, see what's valued, uh, and that gives everybody on the team a chance to have more success. So if, we, if you can, give praise in public. Um, criticize in private. So we talked a lot about how hard it is for people to hear criticism. It's very difficult. It's not because you're dysfunctional. It's because you're human. Um, well, that's one-on-one. -on -one. It's difficult for people to hear. Imagine now you're giving a person criticism in front of, in front of a large group of people. Um, that will be very hard for them to hear. They talk about a threat response, right? Um, so criticize in private. To me, it seems so obvious um, that you should never have to say it. Um, and yet we had someone write in uh, to our podcast and say that their boss was organizing a meeting. Um, where basically the boss needed to give a team member some very, t very difficult feedback. And the boss's logic was that this person in private 
was very likely to point fingers at other people and make excuses. And that might, that might actually be true. I mean, that doesn't sound like crazy, like a crazy idea that could happen. I've, I've seen that before. So the boss's idea for dealing with this problem was to make it impossible uh, for this person to point fingers at other people by convening a meeting where the six people this person would be most likely to point fingers at were in the meeting together. And the boss would give criticism to that person, making it impossible for that person to point fingers at the other people because they're in there, um, in there with them, uh, and and therefore they 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 you know are, would have to be accountable for erroneous finger pointing. Mm. I, I I mean I I can't like the 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 worst part about this is how much thought went into. So I th I just thought well if people make a mistake about criticizing in public it would more be like an a, like a like a crime of passion like they just sort of lost themselves in a moment where they mm -hmm. you know and they just did it by accident and felt bad and apologized. This boss like planned this for like two weeks. And um, this person who wrote in is like, I, this seems wrong. I'm on this team. I'm going to be in this meeting. And I was like, you, you have to do everything you can to call this meeting off because this is going to be really bad, really bad for everyone, for the boss, for this person, for the people in the room. Um, it's going to leave a mark on this team for weeks and weeks and weeks. And uh, this, this woman who wrote in was actually successful in getting the meeting taken off. I, you know, I, I gave her a bunch of ideas of how to convince the boss not to do this. But like these, these kinds of uh, sociopaths are out there. Um, like coming up with this kind of logic that, oh yeah, I'm going to criticize her in front of her peers so she can't point fingers at her peers. Um, I, which I, I just can't. I mean, I don't know if that, does that sound as crazy to you? It sounds pretty crazy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I, I just, when I said, saw this, my, I mean, my jaw and, and it's one of those moments where I turned to Elise, our, our marketing person. I turned to Kim and I was like, you cannot, you cannot make this up. Yeah. You just can't make this up. I mean, it's crazy. So that, that, that's kind of, that's kind of the, uh. The exam. Yeah. What, what was your question? Was that your question? <laughs> no, my que that was my question. The, the, the things that you have to, the basic things of being a manager that you have to say to people that surprise you that people don't already know that if they're managers. So, yeah. 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 Well, I want to talk about Candor Inc. Um, a little bit more and the Candor app. Um, and, uh, but first I'm going to take a minute to thank our sponsor. It's time to hire someone. You're busy because you're already doing that someone's job who left but you still wanna hire the right person and it's the most important thing. And one way to find a really great person for whatever you do is ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter lets you post your jobs to 100 plus job sites with just one click. They have powerful technology. It matches the right people to your job better than anyone else. If any of the stuff that we've talked about, all this management stuff scares you, start with the right person and it's easier, I promise. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. Over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. You can screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. I love dashboards. I love to be able to see everything, and so you don't have to keep track of it. You can see everything right there, and your people will come to you. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, you can post on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. One more time to try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. And you can try it and see if you don't find the right person for your job. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Triangulation. If you are just joining us, I am talking to Russ Lairway. Russ is the founder of Candor Inc. He is uh, formerly from Google, from Twitter, and the Marines, and the Wharton School of Business. And we've been talking about uh, his company, Candor, and what they can do. And so you have the, the Candor app. Um, which I downloaded, and it just is sort of a little uh, guide to all the principles that you're talking about. Um, talk a little bit about the app. Yeah, yeah, it's called the Candor Coach, only available on iOS. And the idea is, um, so we we think about this is this stuff's hard to do, and to get better at this stuff, you have to practice. Um, and so we use we use a dental metaphor to to think about this. So um, imagine you go to your semi annual cleaning. And then you, and you get scraped and, you know, and they do all the polishing and all that stuff. And then you walk out of there and then you don't do anything to your teeth for the next six months. 
Describe for me the state of your mouth when you walk back in there. From- oh, it's painful. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a, me- a disgusting yeah, I'd rather not describe what it looks like, but yeah, it would be okay. painful. To- <laughs> yeah. That's right. So um, uh, you have to brush and floss in between, right? And um, look, you got to go to your semi-annual cleaning. You got to get on the same page as your dentist. Uh, you might uh, uncover some big stuff in there. A um, little bit of like prophylactic care goes a long way. Um, and you know, get x-rays maybe every other time, something like that. You, get, you have to go do it, right? Cause you have to, you have to get underneath what, you know, the full sort of picture of, of your mouth. Um, but if that's all you did, um, you would have an awful lot of problems. So you got to also brush and floss, but brushing and flossing clearly is not enough on its own because you've got to go in there and get checked up regularly to make sure things are, things are squared away. And so, um, we teach a lot of companies, we go and we do these workshops and um, the workshops are a little bit more akin, I would say, to the semi-annual cleaning. Now, now they're not akin to a root canal. Okay. They're akin to a semi-annual cleaning. Um, we go in, we get on the same page, common language, common vocabulary, teach the model, do a bunch of skill building, an important step to take. Um, but if that's all we do, very small, no- you go in and do any workshop. I don't care if Tony Robbins comes in here and does his best workshop. A really small number of people are capable of a really small number of behavior changes coming out of that. However, um, if you can add in the brushing and flossing component, i.e. something like an app, plus our podcast, plus you know the content we put out on our website and on our blog, things like that that help you keep this going, um, you have a better chance at, at having behavior change. So that's the, that's the basic idea of the purpose of the app is just to give you um, little tasks. So we'll teach you something that, uh, about maybe how to give praise better. And then we'll tee up a member on your team and we'll say, why don't you go practice giving praise, right? So, um, so here's get good praise is specific and sincere. Here's what it means to be specific. Now go give Megan some praise today and then come back and let us know how you did. And so we're trying to give you just little bite-sized chunks of content and then a little bit of a task and someday some tools to help you do these things better. So that's the current state and it's all about feedback. The vision for the Candor Coach is way cooler. Um, there's all these things that managers need to be good at in order to do their jobs well. Not only feedback, but they also have to have career conversations with people. They need to be able to have growth plans with people. They need to be able to run an effective one-on-one. They need to be able to run an effective staff meeting, on and on and on. Now imagine a a place, um, not just an app, but something that can also meet you where you are in Gmail and Calendar or Slack, all those things, where we're giving you tips, for doing these things well. We'll teach you by tips. We'll give you tasks to practice and we'll give you tools to support those things like an agenda creator for a staff meeting that's built on you know good, really good sort of staff meeting hygiene. So that's where the candor coach is going. Um, and the idea is that every manager needs some coaching, but m- almost no companies can afford to give those managers the coaching that they need. And so we're gonna give you a little coach in your pocket that's inspired by the ideas in the book, um, Radical Candor, and the ideas in the podcast, uh, Radical Candor. And so the HIP uh, in person, we haven't really talked specifically about that. You say give feedback in person. Uh, for remote companies, What what is, is Skype okay? Yeah, great. It's a great second, it's, it's great question. So we talk about in person and immediate in person and immediate. And I'll often talk about those as there's, there's, off, there's often a trade-off. And when you have a team or a group of people that are remote, um, you necessarily have to make a trade-off. It's necessary that you make a trade-off between immediate and in-person. Um, and so we say, if you have to choose, choose immediate, right? Help them fix it faster. Think about the competitive gymnast. Um, it's useless to give them that feedback on Friday night for the vault run that they did on Monday, right? They, they can't learn anything from that. Um, and that means we have to trade off in person because by definition, the team's you know, geographically distributed or something like that. And so we've, we've thought through this a little bit. And uh, the reason why in-person feedback matters so much is because so much is communicated non-verbally. Even, I, I don't know if you know this, but even voice inflection is considered non-verbal. Um, verbal is really just the words. Mm-hmm. Um, and non-verbal is everything else, the body language, the voice inflection, everything. And... Uh, giving feedback in person allows you to understand their nonverbals. It allows you, by the way, it allows you to project nonverbals, which can really convey sincerity, which I think is crucial um, to helping feedback land better is that you're very sincere, you know, especially in the context of praise. It's important, like really mean it mm-hmm. and not try, sound like you're trying to buck people up with false praise. So you have the best chance of conveying everything and 
hearing everything back when you're in person. So the question is, well, if you can't be in person, what's second best? Skype is a great, is a great Skype slash Google Hangout slash Zoom slash BlueJeans, any video conferencing type of uh, software, you, you still can get most of the nonverbals, um, right? And this stuff's so pervasive and easy now. I mean, it, there's just really no excuse for not, for not doing that. Um, we say second best after Skype, it, you know, first best in person, second best is Skype or video. And then third, of course, is phone. Um, you at least still get the voice inflection nonverbal if you don't get the body language. And um, we say, just don't, don't do it in email and text. Um, you know, and there's some, there's some small, there are places where people have a little operating culture, a few people where they can give each other feedback through chat and things like that. And when people have something that seems to work for them, I, I don't, I'm talking about <clears throat> it generally, if you're not expecting it, it's not part of your culture, you get some kind of criticism over text. That's the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and email, email is the one where we're most likely to make a mistake. We mm -hmm. give far too much feedback over email. Um, and we, you just lose, you know, I mean, all of us know, and we've learned this lesson repeatedly. I, I learned this lesson still constantly that it is impossible to strike the right tone in email. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many emojis you put in there, it's impossible to strike the right tone and, and to get feedback to land the way you intend. Um, and so we say, don't, don't do it. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, probably not in Snapchat or Facebook or Twitter either. Yeah, I think probably <laughs> skip those as well. Um, yeah. Definitely skip those as well. Yeah, no feedback in a Facebook comment. That's good. So, so <laughs> Candor Inc., um, you offer services to big businesses, Twitter, other big businesses, and, and small businesses as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd say our the customers we've had so far have been pretty evenly split, um, large, small, by industry. And... and I wasn't necessarily expecting that, um, but talking to all these companies every week, I realize, I realize what's happening is just the way they talk about their problems varies by size of company, but the problem in essence is the same, which is a um, very large company called me one time, was vice president of strategy at a company you've definitely heard of. Um, and she said, we're just looking at our engagement scores. You know, they're running an engagement survey like most companies of any size do this day uh, and, um, or does this day. And she says, um, and our middle level of management is killing engagement at our company. And what, what was underneath that point was a lot of times we, we, we devote a lot of energy and effort to squaring away senior people because one senior person has a lot of leverage over an organization. If we can fix her, we can fix him, you know, it's a really good return on investment. But, you know, by definition, because most companies are shaped like this, the, the middle and lower levels of management just don't get... In almost any company, large or small, they just, they just, there's not enough resources to really ramp these people up well. And so what this woman was saying was the fact that our managers are potentially, they were selected poorly and then we haven't ramped them up well. They've not been trained. They've been just figured out on their own. They're actually killing the engagement in our company. And, and by the way, that study I mentioned, the state of global engagement goes into some detail about the relationship between employee engagement and relative performance and earnings per share high when there's high engagement, top decile, 147% better performance and earnings per share versus their competitors um, to, for the top decile engagement companies. Engagement really matters to business results. So that's how a large company talks about it. A small company, a CEO will call me. So now it's not the VP of strategy because they don't have one. It's the CEO, which nearly every company has. And that person says, you know, we used to all fit in one room. And uh, we could criticize the work. We could praise the work. Everybody just knew it was to get better and it was one for all, all for one, you, you know, this kind of, you can imagine this, right? And um, we were just co constantly focused on the objective. Everybody knew it was just about getting better. Well, now we've spread out across one floor or, or we're on two floors and we've entered, we've put in another layer of management and I'm worried we're losing our culture. And, um, you know, culture, culture is like cement, right? It sets really fast. And once it sets, you need a jackhammer to get it undone. So I, I applaud these these companies for thinking about this stuff real early. Um, but it's the same thing. It's still an engagement problem ultimately being caused by, you know, some layer of management often because they're not generally several things, but most common is they're not giving feedback. It's not even the feedback quality. It's low feedback quality. It's just that it doesn't exist and people want feedback. And so, um, I've, I've just discovered, I didn't, I've just discovered this problem persists across every industry. We've worked in financial services. We've worked in tech. We have a lot of interest from schools 
uh, which is not something I saw coming, but we have a lot of interest from schools. Um, we've worked in manufacturing. We've, I mean, we worked everywhere. And, um, and we've worked with companies that are tiny, 50 people, and we work for companies that were enormous, you know, 100,000. Um, so, uh, and it's because everybody has the exact same problem, um, which is got to improve, got to improve their managers, um, so that their people have better experiences at work. Well, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, Russ. So if you want the annual dental cleaning, then you can go to Candor Inc. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the flossing and brushing, that's the app, the podcast, the blog, great advice there. Um, what if you do need the root canal? <laughs> yeah, if you do need the root canal, um, you know, you have to go see a specialist for sure, <laughs> okay. you know, and I don't know what that looks like. It could be that you need to go see um, a, a psychiatrist um, or it could mean that you need to go hire a coach too because you're, you're, you need so much one-on-one -on -one help. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the root canal is tough. It also could mean that um, maybe you're just not supposed to be a manager. Mm -hmm. um, if you're finding that you need root canal a lot of the time, Maybe you're not supposed to be in this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Radicalcandor.com. And also there's the Radical Candor book, Kim's book. Um, it's great. Also, uh, where you can read a lot Best about Bestseller. Yeah, awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, and are you do, are you on Twitter? I am, at R-A-L-1. Uh, at R-A-L. Like Russell Anthony Laraway 1. <laughs> uh, there's some guy out there who has at R-A-L, and he's active on Twitter. And mm. so before I left Twitter, I couldn't get it. Oh. But I got R-A-L-1. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Russ. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Uh, check out RadicalCandor.com. Um, and for more information, check out their podcast. You can subscribe at all the places where you can subscribe to Triangulation. And subscribe to Triangulation as well. Triangulation records every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific. And uh, we will see you next week. <laughs>